After seven years, CM Punk is back in AEW, but the WWE has their own big surprises as well. Welcome to my WWE SummerSlam 2021 review. All right, starting off with the first match from the pre-show, it was Big E versus Baron Corbin, who recently stole his Money in the Bank briefcase. First, big congratulations, Rain Cruz. She won the WWE announcer contest from TikTok, so big congratulations to her. And as far as the match, well, Big E won and got his briefcase back, and uh, Baron Corbin continues to spiral downhill. One of the more entertaining storylines we got going on SmackDown. Now, heading on to the main show from Las Vegas, Nevada. Well, this match took place in Las Vegas, but you get the point. All right, so the show started off with a Raw Tag Team Championship match. RK Bro consisting of Matt Riddle and Randy Orton versus Omos and AJ Styles. So this match actually had some really good story build up for Monday Night Raw. You know, Raw, honestly, storyline wise, really has not been the best. I think a lot of us who have watched this show over the last several decades can agree. But they've got a nice thing going here with Riddle and Randy Orton. And you could tell, because as you all know, if you've watched my reviews, I'm big on character development and storytelling. And when you actually put a lot of story effort into a match, months of buildup, it gets over. Look how hot this crowd was for Randy Orton and Riddle. You got that in this match, and it was a really good opening match. In the end, Randy Orton hits the RKO on AJ Styles. They still protect almost, you know, they're basically utilizing his strengths and hiding his weaknesses and now we got RK bro as the tag team champions it's kind of like a modern day rock and sock connection and it's good why not make some merch off of it you want to make some merch off of this before the inevitable turn I just hope that it's not Randy Orton doing the turn but rather Riddle and he becomes more evil and sinister and you utilize that legitimate MMA background that he has and be like I was a step or two in front of you Randy you know stuff like that uh the thing too with that is it makes so much sense because now Riddle sees himself as the new legend killer and he's gonna try and take out the older Randy Orton you know Randy Orton getting a piece of his old medicine from his younger years so yeah really great way to start this show off next match Alexa Bliss with Lily the Dow versus Eva Marie with Piper Niven because I'm not going to acknowledge that name that WWE has given her that being said this match uh pretty much what you would expect uh, a lot of shenanigans it's clear I don't know why after the months of training but it's clear that Eva Marie as many fans have often complained about is just not up to the standards in ring wise when you compare her with the other female talent that we have on the WWE main roster but uh, I still stand what I have always believed about Eva Marie she would be definitely a really good valet and everything um, you know as a character she understands that she can generally a lot of heat so that works great uh, but yeah Alexa Bliss picks up the win uh, I think the biggest thing about this was the end where Piper Niven basically ended up coming out with the microphone and stole her uh, robe and said the loser of the match is Eva Marie so that was really cool the ending pretty much as far as this Alexa Bliss storyline and Lily um, you know I'm fine I think Alexa Bliss's performance have been awesome but it just feels like this storyline has been just dragging out like get to it or is, is uh, <laughs> Alexa gonna go Go ahead here and be this devastating evil force that goes throughout the rest of the Raw Women's Division or what? It just feels like they're just taking it really slow with this storyline. I just want to know, where, where is this going? But I don't even know if they know. <laughs> Next match for the United States Championship, Damian Priest versus Sheamus. Now, I don't think there was much story here with this match because from what I think I remember, Damian Priest has been doing a lot of this, what, dripstick? or makeshift uh, super soaker storyline with Miz and Morris and a lot. Uh, I don't know, whatever. But the thing...
thing about this is this is showing right here why it's so crucial that you have a good storyline you have great character development for these matches because the crowd just seemed dead during this match honestly in the very first half these guys had to work extra hard to get them into it and worked hard did they and they absolutely got the crowd back into it and much prop to both these guys they put on as much of a good match as they could uh whereas the storyline like i said wasn't really much put into that but they got into it and uh much prop to those damian priest going over to win the u.s title the right choice uh it's good to see when there are nxt stars who are actually going on to bigger things as we saw with riddle so glad to know that not everybody in nxt is just coming to the main roster and then that's it for them next match the smackdown tag team championships the Mysterials, consisting of Rey Mysterio and Dominic Mysterio versus Jimmy and Jay, the Usos. Um, you know, aside from the issues that we all are aware of with Jimmy Uso, as I said on the No DQ review, I hope that they are, for Jimmy's sake and for everyone else's sake, uh, that they are getting him the help that he needs. Because if not, and they're just putting the title on him, you know, I just hope nothing tragic comes out of this. But you take that aside, like I said, hope for everybody's sake that Jimmy gets the help he needs. Um, this is another thing that I don't understand about WWE's booking nowadays. They have this first time, they could have had this first time meeting be here at SummerSlam, but instead they go ahead and they put it on the previous uh, pay-per-view, Money in the Bank, and then do a rematch here. It just would have felt more special had they build up to this point, but uh, really great high-flying match. Usos go over to keep this storyline going with the bloodline. Uh, so no complaints really good tag team match next match for the wwe smackdown women's championship sasha banks versus bianca belair two or i guess not according to wwe because at the last minute uh for whatever reason sasha banks was not able to get cleared for this show and they replaced her with carmella and you want to talk about the hype level going strong and then they announced carmella and it's like oh i've got a lot to say about this so the crowd of course is disappointed and then Becky Lynch's music hits and everybody goes crazy. I went crazy because I wasn't expecting Becky Lynch to come back this soon. You know, she kept always doing these teases that she's going to be in this city. She's going to be in that city. And I'm like, yeah, I'll just wait till she comes. And then boom, here she is. Uh, Becky Lynch coming down to the ring. Big, huge moment. Um, and I figured this because if Sasha Banks is not going to be competing, then you need something big to make it up for the crowd. Um, and out comes Becky and she makes short work of Carmella and I wish they would have played this into the storyline when she picked up the microphone about how she never lost her Raw Women's Championship. She, instead she just says hey how about you and me for the championship the crowd goes crazy they ring the bell and I'm like yeah I guess you know you needed something big here and I'm like yeah I'm fine with this match but they're kind of going to be booking themselves into a corner here because you don't want to beat Becky in her return match but you don't want to beat uh, Bianca in her ma in a lengthy match but I'm like this will be fine nice 15 minute back Back and forth between the two. Either Becky wins the title here and Bianca looks strong. Or Bianca actually beats uh, Becky and you continue building her up for the future. Um, so I'm like, alright. And a few seconds later, it's 1-2-3 after slamming Bianca to the ground. And Becky has made short work of Bianca. <sighs> this whole segment and the execution of Becky Lynch's return to me uh, is the best way to show basically what's both right and wrong with WWE. I just can't see, you know this was Vince McMahon's final call decision obviously he gets the final call and everything because I just can't see how there were so many options of what you could have done with this whether it be Zelina and Carmella come out and they beat up Bianca and then Becky comes to the save and you have this tag team match or you just do a segment and you tease Becky and Bianca having a face off and then you build up Becky for the next several months have Bianca continue her reign of dominance for the next month for the next several months and then at survivor series you do the big match 15 20 minutes and let them go all out and then becky wins the title there or, or something 
And I'm not even so much, I'm not mad or anything about Bianca losing the title because I knew there was a possibility that they might put the title back on Sasha here. It's the way they did it. You just you just completely eliminated almost everything you did the last several months to build up Bianca as your world champion on SmackDown for the women. Not only that, she went through Sasha, she went through Bailey, Carmella, Zelina. She pretty much was wiping what's left of the uh, SmackDown women's division clean, and now you make Becky come off as if she's overpowered here. She just did in a few seconds what the other women could not do. I, I just it's. It's just not practical booking just from a fan standpoint and wanting to see new stars constantly build they just undercut one of their up-and-coming stars that they were building for Becky Lynch here and you know the four horsewomen of WWE Charlotte Becky Bailey Sasha you know while the booking's been hit or miss at times over the years for the most part you add in Asuka those five women have really helped carry the women's division for the last several years now with women like Rhea and Bianca coming up this is the time to definitely build those stars so that we are constantly having new stars but when you just undercut them like that it just it makes no sense and this is once again more the reason why the wwe i feel is having a hard time building new stars case in point had they been building up some more of these women had they done something with zelina vega uh or they done more with carmella other than just putting her in title matches when you don't have sasha or bailey around you build just build up you have the talent build them up and you don't have to rely on bringing becky lynch out here to squash bianca you could have put someone else in her place but at least give us a 15 minute match you know and maybe be uh maybe becky wasn't completely uh fully back in ring shape then i don't even know why you would put the title on here so it's really one of those head scratching booking decisions that i don't agree with i'm glad becky is back i'm okay that becky is even the smackdown women's champion but to basically give bianca the kofi kingston treatment is just very counterproductive for building new stars that's how I feel about this. So once again, I feel this was not executed. And that's WWE for you in a nutshell nowadays. They know how to bring you up with such an amazing moment and then take you right back down and remind you of a lot of the booking decisions that just doesn't make it as fun as it was to watch back in like the 80s or if you're like me, the Attitude Era or the Ruthless Aggression Era for a lot of you younger ones out there uh, that are in your 20s now. I know that if you've grown up watching the era, you know we all can agree these were fun times in WWE and now nowadays you get this and i'll also add on that i have not been a fan of the way that bianca has been booked so far as champion like yeah she's been strong but in terms of the characters like the matches have been awesome her constantly going over has been awesome but in terms of the character like things that they've done where like bailey has basically made a fool of her backstage and bianca's just looking like like confused and, and stuff like that time they had her come out and basically instead of basically just coming out and taking her earrings off and her belt off and you know just coming down there getting her tail and just whooping the crap out of Bailey. instead they have her just come out and point and laugh and it's like come on just have Bianca go out there trash talk brag on herself about being the baddest woman in the WWE and then just have her just just you know things like that is what would have I think been appealing to mainstream audiences who don't even watch WWE or lapsed fans they've been like oh this Bianca girl's bad but they book her in situations as we saw in SummerSlam today where you know she was all happy about you know Becky's return and then she looks a little hesitant about should I accept this match and then she ends up losing quickly like that's just not adequate for building a new star moving on to the next match Drew McIntyre versus the modern day Maharaja Jinder Mahal in what was pretty much a quick squash match for Drew McIntyre making short work of Jinder there you go. Easy night for Drew McIntyre. Next up, the triple threat match for the Raw Women's Championship. Nikki Cross, because I'm not really feeling this whole Nikki Ash storyline, versus Rhea Ripley and Charlotte 
Flair. Triple threat match was fine. The action was fine. But if you could tell at this point, the crowd heat was just down. <laughs> it was hard for me to get into this match a little bit too as well. Because now that we know Becky Lynch is on SmackDown in the champion, you don't know where this story is going. And Charlotte and Rhea was something they spammed all year for the most part. Uh, and then Nikki Cross, I don't think they went out of their way to really uh, make this superhero gimmick uh, very credible, uh, calling herself almost a superhero, having her uh, cash in the cowardly way when you're trying to be this representation uh, of doing the right thing and stuff like that. Like, I'm okay with the inspirational superhero gimmick, but when she was champion, she constantly called herself almost a superhero and it's like well how far do you have to go to become a true champion if you're when you're the when you're the top world champion and you're still saying you're almost it's like wow and not only that they had uh when she fought charlotte straight up she loses and then i think she did get the clean win over um charlotte making her one of i think only two women um that are not uh, part of the four horsewomen of WWE to actually get a 100% clean victory over um, Charlotte with no pre or in match shenanigans because anytime Asuka's gone over Charlotte there's always been something either have to happen before or during the match to give her a storyline excuse for winning so uh, props to Nikki on getting that at least but yeah after that they had Rhea beat her and then from there I think what they were having Nia Jackson bears her with the stink face and then she ended up still losing that tag match in the same night so when you put all that together and exclude her one time beating charlotte and what happened in this match it's like you know i don't see how anybody could say they really booked nikki they went out of their way to book nikki as credible as of a as, to be as credible as a champion as possible um, and like I said, there were some cool spots in this match uh, with Charlotte, particularly, you know, doing the usual. And in the end, she get with like the corkscrew moonsault to the outside and she ends up getting Nikki in the figure eight taps her out. And I guess she now is in is now officially a 12 time world champion since they didn't want to count the NXT ones anymore. Um, and Charlotte's champion again. And. You know, I, like I said, I like Charlotte Flair, but I like to see something different from her. She's been doing this whole Eric and Queen gimmick for years now, and that's one of the things that makes Roman Reigns so appealing now, um, you know, in terms of entertainment, is that he's doing something different, something new. I have no problem with Charlotte Flair. I think she's fantastic. A uh, great wrestler in the ring. I think uh, she definitely can nail the promos well, but once again, give me something different, and on Raw, I don't know what to really look forward to, because we talk about undercutting it feels like they've undercut it Rhea Ripley uh Rhea should still be champion they should really be building Rhea and Bianca up still as your world champions right now the Nikki Cross uh soup almost superhero gimmick like I said they didn't build any credibility and now that Becky's all over on Smackdown I I don't know they might actually give Charlotte a lengthy reign this time as opposed to just taking the title right off of her so yeah, um, yeah, not a fan of this booking at all. And now we get to the match that I think easily could be the match of the night. And this is where I'm talking about Edge versus Seth Rollins. The storyline was great. Building up to their history over the past seven years. The presentations of the entrance was great. Edge coming out to the old brood theme and old brood persona. I was a kid back then when Edge was coming out with the leather jacket and the glasses and then how he morphed into the current rated R superstar. <laughs> Quick plug, by the way, if you haven't seen my WWE announcer contest entry on TikTok, TikTok, uh, check it out. Uh, all links in the description below for my social media where you can watch that. Um, at and then you have Seth Rollins coming out with the Michael Jackson inspired uh, attire. This was good, but the match was awesome. Just a lot of great back and forth action. Seth Rollins pulling out all his usual moves. Edge, Edge broke out the uh, the uh, what was it the um the, his old submission the Educator that was really good. They were going back and forth. A lot of great spots uh, of doing the spear and just really. Focusing the story element, the psychology of Seth constantly want to finish where he started, trying to nail that curb stomp and Edge constantly avoiding it, especially at the end when he caught it with his foot and he eventually ended up, in my surprise, getting Seth Rollins to tap 
out and Edge gets a big win, which I think was much needed. And I felt the storyline here definitely made it up for it. Uh, this is one of the examples where I'm okay with the older talent and Edge going over the younger talent in Seth Rollins um, because they can always run it back. Seth constantly going, you know, sort of just spiraling out of control as a heel eventually to when he, maybe we get that uh, baby face uh, turn up against Roman. So overall, this match was fantastic. Can't say enough things just from storyline up to the very finish. Everything about this match worked. And this is professional wrestling when, when done right. Could you imagine if this show had just as much going for it, at least from a storyline perspective? If every single match on this show just had a very good storyline and very good characters to it, man, this SummerSlam to me would have felt so much better. Uh, so yeah, I definitely thought this was probably the match of the night. Next up, the co-main event match for the WWE Championship. Goldberg versus the WWE WWE Champion, the almighty Bobby Lashley with MVP. Um, you know, it's the match that I never really thought about that I wanted and I didn't really care to see it, but if they couldn't get Brock Lesnar, which, spoiler coming later in this review, uh, I guess you might as well go with Goldberg. Um, and I will say this, this was actually, who would have ever thought Goldberg would have a longer match than even Becky Lynch on the show? You talk about swerves. Goldberg, um, going in a longer match with Bobby Lashley. I think this match, I time did a little over seven minutes or so um, and they found really good ways to make the match go on longer uh, so that it didn't have to you know we, we all know that Goldberg's conditioning you know people would probably say in the back in the beginning his cardio wasn't much even in his prime and especially now in his older age uh, but he looked in tremendous shape the entrance is always awesome I still stand by that I was a fan of Goldberg and still am I just don't think they need to be putting him in these championship matches and having him go over some of your crucial younger talent that you need to be building up towards um and that being said though this match was hard hitting as you would expect Goldberg he actually put out some other more power slam moves almost scared me at one point when he threw uh Bobby off the ring and Goldberg and Bobby almost landed off his head uh but yeah overall this was good but then the part about this match is I thought it was over complicated booking Having MVP interfere, I thought was unnecessary. There's one part where MVP takes his um, cane, which I don't know why he's still walking on anyway, since we know he's he can wrestle. He wrestled a match without it, so yeah. But he whacks Goldberg in the back of the leg, and Goldberg actually is delayed in terms of selling it, and this just jacked Goldberg's leg up for the rest of the match, and Bobby went to town on him so much that the referee had to call a stoppage to a match. Yes, Bobby wins. He looks dominant, but was MVP interfering necessary? It goes back to what I always thought about the Hell in a Cell match. There was no need to have MVP interfere. Just have Bobby get a dominant victory over Goldberg, call the day, and keep things moving. But the way they set things up here, it was like they're planning for a second match with Goldberg. Even though I think he's exhausted his two matches that are on his contract, unless WWE is going to pay him a lot more money. They got that big Saudi Arabia show coming up soon, so maybe they're planning for Lashley versus Goldberg too. And in the end of the match, um, Gage Goldberg, who is uh, Gold Goldberg's son, gets and hops on top of Bobby Lashley to try and choke him out. And Lashley quickly puts him in the hurt lock, which is surprising. I didn't think they were going to get physical with a 15-year-old, but I'm pretty sure Lashley protected him. And basically, MVP's like, oh, hold on. We didn't know that was Goldberg's son. It could have been anybody attacking Lashley. And, you know, because Lashley never saw him. He just grabbed whoever was on his back and put him in a hurt lock, put him down. And so Goldberg wakes up and realizes, oh, crap. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. So you know this is far from over. And Lashley walks away with the championship. And I guess we're getting Goldberg and Lashley too. Like I said, I just would have preferred Goldberg. Why, why couldn't Lashley just dominate Goldberg, work the leg, and it was Lashley's own strength that did it? He didn't. Why even rely on MVP? So, you know, like I said, right outcome. But I thought, once again, not the right execution. And if we're going to bring Goldberg back for a second, match why do it against Lashley do something new do an attraction match we've never seen before so it's like I, I don't like when they do these rematches with part-timers who you only got a short time with and now the main event for the WWE Universal Championship John Cena 
versus the WWE Universal Champion, Roman Reigns. This is their second match. This is the rematch to their No Mercy uh, match from four years ago. The build-up to this match was great. You had both men taking jabs at one another. Roman Reigns cannot stress how absolutely better he has gotten on the microphone since WWE has let him be himself this tribal chief character this tribal chief gimmick and how they've been booking him it's been great I love it he has been absolutely probably the best part of WWE over the past year uh you see where Roman is now just uh, tremendous um but honestly in most of the build-up I gotta be honest I agree a lot with Roman John Cena saying the same old thing over and over and over and over whereas Roman was funny you know with the whole missionary line and, and stuff like that like Roman or honestly I, I thought Roman Reigns pretty much owned scene on the mic uh and I wish they would have actually let Roman go even harder because there's a lot more you could have said about John Cena the build-up but we're here now for the match itself and um this match Overall, I would say went a lot like their first match. Kind of started off really slow with Roman dominating and then picked up with Cena making a comeback. And then the last several minutes of the match was back and forth action. But what was different here was Roman Reigns, like I said, not just on the mic, but in the ring on a whole different level. And I actually always liked Roman Reigns. Uh, I just wasn't a fan of them booking him like as if he was going to be Cena 2.0. And when Roman was in this ring, man, he really helped carry the first part of this match because John Cena was basically taking a beat down. Roman's trash talking was fantastic. Just what I'm talking about, these storylines, when you have those story care, those storylines and the character development, magic happens. And um, Cena was rolling around a lot in this match, just going, a lot of his offense basically was just doing roll-ups in the match, going for pinfalls. And I'm like, is this match just going to be Cena making pins? Even for Cena standard matches, uh, Cena's a lot better than this. So I was thinking maybe they're taking it safe because obviously he's got a new movie to shoot right after this. Um, but it, like I said, it picked up towards the end. Cena started making his comeback with you know as many have always said the five moves of doom and I love that Roman even caught him and uh and basically tried to put him when he bent over to do the you can't see me put him in the uh guillotine lock um and Cena was doing out some big AAs through the uh ring and through the uh the announcer table even off the ropes and you know only few people kick out of that and Roman still kicked out Cena could not put Roman Reigns away and in the end Roman picks up the clean win again after four years just like he did back then doing it now and yeah I went crazy I'm like that's right the tribal chief put Cena down twice clean the only thing that would have been better was to have John Cena tap out that was the only thing about this match when it came to the near falls I had to remind myself like oh that's right Roman said that he would leave WWE that was them basically taking a big sign saying Roman's not winning this match <laughs> um but overall it was good and the near falls were still great Roman and um, nearly kicking out. They they made it look very believable with those near falls. So that was fantastic. I enjoyed this match. I liked it better. Like I said, it was more or less their first match, but Roman has come into his own now as such a better all-around performer. So that was really good. Uh, I just wish they would have had Roman uh, make Cena tap out to the guillotine. And now we're, we're big business. Now you're talking about putting Roman on that whole next level. Um, and then the thing too is that uh, I thought maybe make this an I quit match instead. If they made this an I quit match, now nah, there's real drama. There was no way. I don't think Roman is Cena going to say I quit. Wow, that's a big deal, right? So, uh, Roman picks up the win, and you think it's all over. And then out comes to another big shocker, Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar returns, and he comes out to a huge pop. So, like I said, you know, AEW brought out CM Punk. WWE's bringing out Becky and Brock way sooner than we probably thought we would see them. Brock comes out with his new look, so I'm and I'm digging the new look, something to change things up. And basically, it looks like he's a baby face now, and he comes face to face with Roman Reigns. Now, coming face to face with Roman Reigns, this is a guy that honestly has been a thorn in Roman's side because Roman never really got a clean victory over uh over Brock. Brock, you know, Seth Rollins interviewed the first time and then they had that time back in what was it? I think 2018 where they kept spamming Roman and Brock over and over and over and I'm pretty sure cuz I started doing WWE reviews at that time um I, I know I was like, you know, what are you going to do? Just give this guy the championship. They, they it seemed like they were afraid to go there with Roman beating uh Brock and at this time, you know, I wasn't a fan 
fan of the way they were booking Roman Reigns. But I'm like, just get it over with and everything. And they never went there. And when they finally did, Brock, uh, it was all a bunch of shenanigans. Short match filled with shenanigans of Braun Strowman interfering. And, and Roman finally got the win. So this time, make sure Roman goes over it decisively clean. That's what I want to see the WWE book. Have Roman go over decisively clean against Brock Lesnar to put him on that level. That's what's on that next level. That's what needs to be seen. And as I mentioned earlier, you bring in Brock Lesnar the same night that he's faced that Lashley faces Goldberg. So close. So hopefully they're eventually building up to Brock Lesnar versus Lashley. Hopefully also they're not hot shotting this. Are they really gonna do Brock versus Roman at Extreme Rules? Um, why not wait to Survivor Series or, or something like that? Um, so we'll see where they end up going. But the dynamic is different now, and that's and you know I'm not a fan of these constant rematches. But like I said, with Charlotte, do something different. The dynamics are so much different. Now it's like Paul Heyman's going to be in this tug of war with Brock and uh, Roman back and forth. And I guess maybe if he goes back with Brock, because Brock's probably going to need him in order to talk, you're going to have Roman Reigns, basically, who can more than carry himself on the mic. So we'll see what direction they go into. Overall, I thought SummerSlam was kind of a mixed show, really. There was just, This was a four-hour long show where a lot of the matches just did not have the story, uh, the the exciting storylines and characters I felt to really back it up um, and making it a strong card. So, honestly, I would recommend the matches that Seth and Roman had with Cena and uh, Edge, fantastic. The opening match was good. And then a lot of the other show is kind of just, yeah, I mean, there were some good matches. Like I said, the U.S. title match was good but just yeah you you this sh this show really showed why the WWE needs to put more better focus on building these characters and storylines up or else it just feels like a lot of matches are just there honestly and that's the problem with this show um Becky Lynch and Brock Lesnar back huge returns but I still disagree with the execution of how they did Becky Lynch's return so we got to see what this means of going into the future and that's basically what the show reminds you a lot of WWE they know how to bring up the hype but then you can't allow yourself to get hype so many times it's hard Hard to get invested because of what they do uh, here. Uh, but yeah, overall, you know, with CM Punk's return in AEW, Brock and Becky back in the WWE, uh, it is still, I would say, an exciting time for pro wrestling. And that's what we need. Two companies, uh, you know, dishing out as, as much hard-hitting uh, action as they can and stories and twists and turn uh, to get the fans really invested because that's what made us as fans from back in the Monday Night War era so so excited to watch wrestling every week and I don't think it's going towards there obviously now but definitely an exciting time to be a pro wrestling fan that being said guys I will most likely be back with a Survivor Series 2021 review thanks for watching check out my content here on the screen plus remember to like share comment subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you are notified when I release new content also if you're interested in any of the equipment that I use or TubeBuddy, which is a great tool that can help you grow on YouTube I'll have all links in the description and pinned comment below along with all my social media platforms